Speaker is uh, Dai Yixu, uh, Hira Mazu from CFA, and can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Can you hear me? Yes, and can you see my slides? Yeah, and we can see your slides, so please uh, go ahead, thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> thanks organizers for having me, and thanks everyone for joining. So, <laughs> I'm a postdoc at Harvard CFA, and then today I'd like to talk about like what we can do with the optical observations of FRBs, especially like obtaining their limits, and then how we can use those limits to constrain the models. All right. So everyone in this room should know this plot that like you know. So this is a luminosity versus transient duration, and then FRBs are in general really bright and they have short duration. The only reason I wanted to show this is that they <coughs> span a large, you know, quite a bit, quite a few orders in magnitude in the luminosity space. And then there's an interesting case for this SGL, which is a galactic magnetar that had some FRB-like emissions. And then anything about that luminosity is we see extragalactic repeating FRB populations. So, you know, <coughs> they're bright and then they are gigahertz. They are observed in gigahertz frequencies. But the uh, big question is there is that the their physical origins. But given this luminosity and then the transient durations, uh, some compact objects like highly magnetized compact objects like magnetars have been suggested as a possible parameter of fast radio bursts. But then it could be just aliens. And just to illustrate this point, D also showed this tag, a living theory catalog for fast radio bursts. So there is actually a which page <coughs> listing a possible or like you know fertilized Projector channels for fast radio bursts, and then the projector could actually vary from like you know neutron stars, black holes, or even asteroids interacting with those compact objects. So, <laughs> but what's interesting for me is that is that some predict transit multi wavelength emission and optical like gamma rays, X rays, even down to optical. So this is really the parameter space that we can still explore and then like you know so this is like as Nino Sam mentioned that this is like an early days for gamma ray burst research where the significant you know advance came from the transient multi wavelength you know detections. So this is where this is the parameter space that I'm interested in. And then like you know so what do we expect? for FRB transient multi-wavelength emission. So here I just show one example, which is the synchrotron maser model. So here you have a central engine, like a magnetar emitting a relativistic flare with the flare energy E that interacts with, that interacts with the surrounding medium, which was likely ejected in the previous layer and then this shock interaction creates synchrotron maser emission which we observed as an FRB but at the same time this shock really accelerates the electrons to relativistic speed and then the synchrotron emission from those electrons could be observed as gamma rays, X rays or even down to optical afterglows just like what we see in a gamma ray burst. And then what's important here is the flare energy and then the external density shown here. So if the, you know, especially in this shock interacting region, so this e flare energy and then the external density really determines what we observe as multi wavelength emission. And then for the case of galactic SGL, we've seen these simultaneous radio and X-ray observations. This is a really beautiful result. And then this remains to be the only non-radio transient emission observed to date. And then this is not being possible for the extragalactic FRBs given the, given the current sensitivity of X-ray satellites. So what we can do with the optical. So from this model, I'm showing if we fix the E flare flare energy to this value and then if you change the external density, that's how the light curves are, you know, color coded. You can get light curves with a quite 
long duration, up to thousand seconds or so. And then instead, if you fix the external density to a certain value, and if you value the free energy, you see here again a diverse varieties, you know, diverse like uh, behaviors which could go, you know, which could last up to like ten thousand seconds. So for this model, we might expect like you know, many to hour time scale emission in the optical bands. As in this case, I show the light curves in the R band. So, and then given these models, this is a really perfect time to actually search for optical emission from the FRBs. That, like, you know, now that we have a quite a few well localized FRBs. So, these are the repeating FRBs we analyzed in our recent paper. And then, like, you know, these, there are about like 20 well localized. By saying well localized, I mean localized within two arc seconds of FRBs, 10 of which are repeating, and then these are routinely observed by CHIME and other radio facilities. And in case of CHIME, they distribute real-time alerts when they observe a burst from these repeating bursts. Or if the FRB is particularly in active phase, we can look at the FRB as a CHIME observing, because the observing windows of CHIME is also public. So what we are doing at CFA is to do the follow-up and then also the simultaneous observations with the CFA telescopes, like one Kepler cam on 1.2 meter telescope, and then also by the spec on 6.5 meter telescopes. So Kepler cam is a robotic telescope, and then by the spec is an EQ system. So these are really suited for these kind of, you know, optical counterpart search. And then for these well localized FRBs, we can also combine these data with the public optical transit surveys like GTF and ARPES. So that's what we did in our recent paper. And then, so we compiled, we, we actually compiled the largest optical limits, sample of you know, optical limits by combining our observations, public surveys, and then also literatures, which is showing this plot which is hard to see, but you see a lot of points, and then just to note that these, each law corresponds to, you know, limit in G band, Atlas C band, R band, Atlas O band, I band, and Z band, and then the left column shows time before burst, and the right column shows time after burst. So this is the largest compilation of optical limits to date, and then this is hard to see, so I just wanna focus on the, this recent TFRB 2020-0912A for this talk. So this is discovered at 344 megaparsecs, which is relatively nearby. And then when it was discovered, it was really active. So the estimated burst rate was about 100 bars per hour. So here I show the Kepler cam image taken during, during the during a radio burst from the, this particular FRB, and then showing the DSA localization and the host galaxy here. And then this is a reference image from the pastors, and then for the difference, you don't see anything. So we obtain the limits, and then we obtain such limits for like 13 radio bursts in 10 optical exposures. And then this shows the zoom in version of that, and then so we so our optical limits are within like 10 to 42 or 10 to 41 hours per second and these are actually the data simultaneous limits for extragenic FRBs to date and then if you know i just want to note this one binary spec observations which started only 0.4 seconds after the radio burst but then the binary spec shadow opening timestamps are uncertain within a second or so, so this might indeed be simultaneous within that uncertainty. And so what we can what we can do with these optical limits is to compare some like you know FRB models. In this case I'm comparing fast optical burst models as Nino some mentions. These are some inverse component scaling mechanisms happening on pulsar magnetosphere, pulsar nebula, or maze out flow. And then in this case, since the optical exposure time that we are using is longer than the you know, intrusive 
duration of these optical burst models, we are just showing the effective optical limit, which is the integrated optical limit over the whole exposure time times the exposure time divided by the opt optical duration of these fast burst. And then here showing that effective optical flux limit divided by thank you divided by the FRB flux measurements. And then here showing that particular FRB 2229-12A. So these lines are the are limits as a function of the optical duration. And then also the rectangles show some model predictions from pulsar magnetosphere, pulsar nebula, and then maser art flow. And then it's showing for some other existing simultaneous observations for two other extra galactic FRBs. So for the case of 2020-09-12A, this is the first time that we can actually constrain this upper end of these particular models for the extra galactic FRBs. And then these limits are only on only an order of higher than such a limit for the galactic magnetar. And if this biostatic observations is was indeed simultaneous, <laughs> this proves the same order of magnitude as a galactic magnetar. And then if we can do this with uh, some future observations with the uh, you know let's say a high-speed camera, plant high-speed camera on the Sibari telescope, then we can go even a magnitude deeper, which could even constrain the, which could constrain the model parameter space even more. And then we can also compare this with the afterglow models, like synchrotron maser model that I mentioned, which we expect longer durations. So here I'm showing external density as a versus the Rare energy here, and if we just focus on this 2022 or 912A, these points shows the estimates from the FRB radio bus itself, and then the shaded region shows the parameter space ruled out by the mm -hmm. optical limit. Thanks. So, <coughs> optical limits for FRB constraints 60% of its radio burst parameter space. So, I just want to leave the summary and future prospects here, and then take any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, any question from on site? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So, at the beginning the introduction, you presented that uh, there are many different models for the multi-wave counterpart FRBs. And then I guess for different models predict the different time scale for optical counterpart, I guess. And then uh, what you mentioned is probably you are assuming say thousand second time scale for your observation, probably. But uh, could you provide some comments on the different time scales I mean depending on different uh, models? Yeah, so for the case of like, you know, these fast optical burst models, this like, you know, op optical direction for some models should be comparable to fast radio burst time scale. So like, you know, for this particular FRB, the duration is observed from like, you know, milliseconds to up to a few, like, you know, few, ten, few, few tens of milliseconds. So this is the time scale for this particular model and then like you know for another model which this inverse computer scaling happens the region outside the FRB emission region this optical duration might be much longer that which is the case for like you know pulsar in a supernova remnant and then for the case of afterground models like you know think of the MESA model you expect even longer duration for the optical transients Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, any short question from online? Okay, no. Okay, if not, we can discuss more later in the discussion and let's uh, thanks Daichi again. Thank you. Thank you.